You guys sound great tonight. Our family had a few days of vacation. We had a good break. We're back. We're ready to go for the fall. We're excited. Yeah. I hope you are. Amen. We're going to be starting a series this evening on the book of Acts. Yeah. Acts is where the action is. So the ushers are uh, passing out an outline for you. Please don't make a paper airplane from that. Uh, we do spend the church resources to print these out. So hold on to them. It'll help you the next coming weeks here and months as we go through just a couple of uh, highlights here from it. Uh, the uh, author of the book of Acts is Luke. Uh, and this outline, and really the whole outline of the book is really, we're going to talk about it tonight, is based on Acts chapter 1 in verse 8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, one of the main purposes of the book is the comparison between Peter and Paul, they both have key sermons in the book of Acts, and that's one of the major reasons why the book was written. Uh, the book would have closed probably around 60 A.D. You can see that in the notes. On the second page here on the back, uh, there's a great account in Acts chapter 8. I'm sure we'll touch on it. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch uh, is converted. Some great, great lessons about evangelism in the early church in that story. Uh, the conversion of Saul... Uh, is a very important part of the book. Next to the work of Jesus himself, this was the most important event in the history of Christianity. Uh, Saul studied under Gamaliel in Jerusalem and was also taught the trade of tent making. In Acts 26.10, it appears that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, he was probably 30 or more by the time Stephen was stoned to death, the first Christian martyr there in Acts chapter 7. A lot of people feel like a lot of scholars feel that Paul was married at one time. Uh, he seemed to know a lot about marriage in 1 Corinthians 7. So they feel like he was probably married uh, at the time, uh, and later uh, he was widowed. Uh, Romans 7 is a very uh, famous chapter in the Bible as we study the book of Romans. Uh, by the way, in September, Gordon Ferguson is going to be teaching all of us yeah. on the book of Romans in the Inland Empire for three days. That chapter, he talks about, remember, I, don't, I want to do one thing, but I don't do what I want to do. I do what my sinful nature does. Uh, people feel like he, was, he probably wrote that remembering uh, when he was a Pharisee. Uh, in Acts 22, verse 19 and 20, he never could forget the experience that he had watching Stephen be stoned to death and killed there in Acts chapter 7. Uh, pr the preaching of Peter, uh, we're going to hear about that next week in Acts chapter 2. Had a very famous sermon there at Pentecost. Some other great things in here. Please hold on to it. Those are just a couple uh, of the highlights as we get into the book. Amen? Okay, uh, the title of tonight's lesson is Jesus Casts a Vision. And we're going to pick it up here in Acts chapter 1, verse 1. But let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our Father in Heaven, it's been encouraging already. Uh, thank you so much for the worship service. We pray that uh, it was, has been pleasing to you and will continue to be. Thank you for the book of Acts. Thank you for Luke writing it. God, thank you that Jesus casts a vision for this world to be saved for Him and for you, God. And I do pray that we'll uh, be active in that vision. It won't just be His, it'll be ours as well. And thank you for just the great emphasis on prayer in this first chapter. And God, help it not to just to be something that we do, but really who we are as disciples of Jesus. We love you. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and help this really help feed the church and really help us leave encouraged, challenged, and excited to live our life for you to the full. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 1, Acts 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. Let's stop right there. The first thing is world evangelism. 
Luke starts the book by saying, in my former book. Now, what was that book? The Gospel of Luke, right? I was in Kingdom Kids, and I kind of tossed that out, and there was a pause. I said, okay, which one was it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? And I won't tell you, someone said, John. I said, no, it was actually Luke, but amen. It was the Gospel of Luke. And he uh, addresses this Theophilus. Now, this Theophilus could be a real person. It could have been a former patient of Luke's that was a convert to Christianity. Uh, it could just be a general believer. We don't really know. But that's who it's addressed to. The gospel, he said, covered Jesus' daily life teachings. And all the gospel accounts do that as we read through them. It told the apostles what Jesus wanted to do through them and through the Holy Spirit. It says here that he was crucified on the cross and after that, he rose on the third day, and he appeared for a period of 40 days, right? And he spoke about the kingdom of God. He talked about it a lot. It was the main thing he talked about during that time and really throughout his life. And he would go along and say he would heal someone that was blind and give him sight. And they'll say, thank you, Jesus, for giving me my sight. He said, that's great. Did you hear about the kingdom? And then someone else was maybe deaf, and he would give them hearing. And say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for giving me hearing. He said, that's great, but the kingdom is near. It was the kingdom, the kingdom over and over. In the Gospel of Matthew, there were over 38 references to the kingdom of heaven or to the kingdom of God. Jesus was consumed with the kingdom of God, which includes His church, are we consumed by the same thing? It says here in verse 5 that John baptized with water, of course, in the Jordan River. And a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I shared from our trip, uh, returning from the Middle East just earlier this month, and it's incredible to see it. It flows right into the Dead Sea. And this is where he would be baptizing. And this is where Jesus was baptized. And as you pull down the road, you see the sign, baptismal site of John the Baptist. And Jesus. it's just so faith building to see it. You got to pay 20 bucks to go into it and see that site. Maybe the next trip. But try and picture it. It's amazing. Amazing to see it. It says that John baptized with water. And his baptism was for what? The forgiveness of sins, right? So that sins could be forgiven. It says that Jesus' baptism was not only just for forgiveness of sins, but also the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So people would come out of the water after being baptized by John the Baptist, soaking wet. With Jesus' baptism, you come out ablaze with the Holy Spirit. There's a big difference there. Are you hot for the Lord tonight, church? Are you ablaze with the Holy Spirit? Are you fanning it into flame? Did you fan it into flame this morning? I hope you did. It seemed like you're really into it tonight. It's a good, good audience tonight. World evangelism here. He breaks it down. And this is really one of the major themes of the book of Acts. The first seven chapters talk about the gospel spreading throughout Jerusalem. And then the next four chapters, it gets into Judea and Samaria. And the last 15, it goes and spreads all around the world. Jesus wants the gospel spread all around the world. That's our mission, to win the world for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen? Our local mission is to win the Coachella Valley and the high desert to Jesus Christ. That needs to be our passion. That needs to be our purpose. It's been so encouraging this summer. We've had five conversions. It's been very encouraging. And, you know, you say, well, what's the big deal with that? Well, last summer we didn't have any. So that's, that's improvement, right? That's really good. That's progress. Twyla uh, is in Oklahoma tonight, but she was baptized Thursday night, which is really encouraging. The first medical ministry nurse uh, was baptized. And you know what? The summer's not over yet. Maybe God's even going to do more before this month ends. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, you can study it on your own. It's a scripture you're probably familiar with. Jesus gives this vision in the Great Commission to the apostles and he talks about going and make disciples and you're going to find them in all nations and then to baptize them and we're very grateful uh, if you're visiting here with us tonight thank you for coming uh, it's our honor to have you here we are an international church we have 500 churches in over 150 countries there's a lot more to us than just right here and it says here that we've tried to take that passage literally we've really tried to spread the gospel all around the world and it says in Matthew 28 that you need to be a disciple before you get baptized, right? That's the wording there. And we'll find these everywhere, Jesus said. 
Now, you say, okay, well, what, what really is a disciple? What really defines a Christian? Keep your finger there now. Let's go to Mark 1 for a minute in verse 14. What do I need to be before I'm, I'm really a true disciple? Well, the simplest definition is simply this. In verse 14, it says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus, saw, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. To me, this is the simplest definition of a true disciple of Jesus, of a true Christian. It's simply this. Is your sole primary purpose in life to follow Jesus and fish for men. Then you're a true disciple. If you can't honestly answer yes to that, you're not a true disciple according to what we just read. And a follower of Jesus, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. It means we've got to deny ourselves on a daily basis, read our Bibles and pray, have quiet times regularly, daily. Jesus needs to be first in our life. We need to be part of a loving fellowship. I feel like this is something our church does really well. We've been told that. This is a loving group. And it also means following his teachings and reading the Bible daily, right? If you're going to follow somebody, you need to follow. What is he saying, right? So we need to be reading our Bibles daily. What does it mean to be a fisherman? We need to be reaching out, planting seed, watering the seed, casting our nets out. These guys were fishing for fish. He says, no, come follow me, and now you're going to catch men. And Jesus said, by your fruit, you will be recognized. You say, well, I'm a fisher of men. Then my question to you is, what are the lives of the people you're catching look like? Are their lives really changing? Is there the fruit of the Spirit in their life? Has their lives really changed too? In a true conversion, they will. Amen? Amen. That's really the simplest definition of it. I remember when I first studied the Bible years ago, and we did this study. It was a discipleship study on being a disciple of Jesus, and I wasn't doing it. It was very obvious to me when, when I was going through the Scripture. I wasn't doing any of it, but I wanted to. And then at the end of the study, the, the ministers, they asked me, what about your salvation, Danny? You think you're saved? I said, well, I'm a good person. I think so. God knows my heart. And they said, you know what? Let's look at Romans 3 because a good moral life doesn't save you. That's what I thought, that if you're a good person, God knows our heart. How I many of you maybe had that thought, right? Maybe have, some of us probably thought that. That doesn't save us. What does? The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 25, James talked about it in the communion. Faith in the blood of Jesus. That's what saves us. Romans 3, verse 25. We're all sinners, verse 23 tells us. All of us. The best of us are a mess, right? When do we come in contact with that saving blood of Jesus for the first time? At baptism. Romans 6, 1 through 4. Faith in the act is what saves us. It's the participation in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We're going to have a lot more on baptism next week in Acts chapter 2, because they had a whole lot of baptisms when the church started there on the first day. If you're visiting with us here, we're grateful that you're here. I've got a question for you. Have you ever been baptized in water, immersed as a true disciple, that your sole primary purpose for living was to follow Jesus and fish for men? If not, guess what? You only got wet. Study the Bible with us this week. See what Jesus' dream is for your life. And see what the Bible is all about. He's got a great plan for all of us. In John chapter 12, verse 24, it says, If a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it'll produce many seeds. <clears throat> We're going to need a high, high-level church of self-denial this fall so God can build His church from all of us. We're all going to have to be a part of that. We're going to have to be in the Word daily. We're going to need to be praying a lot. Don't miss one day, not to check it off the list, but because you want to connect with God. You need that Holy Spirit inside of you to be active, to do what God wants us to do. I want to encourage you, challenge you, do it first thing in the morning. Don't let the day get away from you. We're going to have to share our faith a lot. A lot. We're going to have to be out there scattering seed, building relationships, practicing hospitality. I'm so encouraged about our campus ministry. There's six disciples, and we're with them Friday for the devotional. They had a couple of friends with them. And they've challenged each other for the last two weeks that every one of those six would at least share with 200 people. 
That's, that's a lot of folks, and a lot of them have done it. No wonder they're doing it. No wonder they've got some good studies going on right now. God will bless that heart. We will reap what we sow. What are we sowing? Be a little careful with this, a little caution on the sharing. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, I took uh, my son Caleb uh, to Legoland on Monday. That's his favorite. He's 10 years old. That's his favorite place on earth. He's an easy... He's an easy fix right now. That's an easy thing to do, right? A lot of us, we need a lot more than that. But he's just happy as a lark to be able to go to Lego. He had the biggest smile on his face. I mean, he moved so fast that morning. I said, why don't you move this quick every morning? Man, he was just running in there. So we're there. So we're going around. MJ and uh, our daughter, Charlie, were back east visiting family. So it was just father-son trip. And so we're walking around, having a good time at Lego, 75 degrees. And then they have this new booth there. This guy says he'll guess your age for five bucks. And if he comes within, he gets two, you have to, he has to get within two years, two years and two months of your age. And if he doesn't, you get a stuffed animal. And so Caleb's like, let's do it, dad. Everyone can, you know, Caleb's five, two and he's 10. Everyone thinks he's older. He goes, I'll do it. I bet. Goes, Why don't you do it, dad? I bet he'll say you're younger. I said, thank you, son. You know, <laughs> so we thought about it, thought about it. I said, how much is it? Five bucks. And I looked at the animals. And I said, well, I don't think my daughter would like any. We're going to pass. So we didn't do it. He goes, oh, come on, man. I'll give you the two years. I'll get it within two months. I'll guess your age within two months. And he was like taunting me, you know. And I didn't buy though. I kept my hand on my wall. I didn't do it. So anyways, next day we're at Target. And uh, we're checking out the check stand. And uh, I don't even know how the conversation came up. I think I had to show my ID because I was using the Visa card or something. And then uh, somehow the topic of age came up with the cashier. And uh, my son goes, yeah, and he tells her the whole story, and they have this guy who tries to guess your age, and she goes, well, <laughs> she goes, I'm, I'm going to guess. He goes, how old do you think my dad is? And she goes, uh, like 45. I go, oh, bless you, here's some more money, you know, thank you, I'm younger than that. <laughs> and then she asked the question I didn't want her to ask. Now guess my age. <laughs> she was, she had a lot of gray hair, and whatever, whatever was... Some spirit came out of my mouth. I don't know which one. And I said, okay, I don't want to do it. She goes, no, guess. Come on, come on. And uh, so she was like ringing up the things. And then I said, 55. And, and as soon as I said that, she hit some key and the whole cash register froze up. Like it just broke. And she goes, she, and she slaps my hand, not hard, you know, like this. She goes, no one's ever said I'm over 40. I go, I'm so sorry. I'm terrible at this. She goes, I'm really 51. I go, well... I said, I was kind of close, you know. <laughs> she goes, oh, no. And she goes, I'm so distraught. Or she, she like, she could not finish. She goes, I need the ma manager, manager. The machine was broke. I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do? I said, I'm so sorry. That probably was not the time to bring out the invitation and invite her to church, right? So be careful with it. We got to be willing to open up our schedules to study with non-Christians. We got to be willing to stay up late, get up early, lose some sleep for Jesus this fall. Amen. Disciples will rapidly increase. God's promise if we're willing to sacrifice for God. And God just wants to open the floodgates right now. I got a call when we were away on our trip from a brother in the coastal region, another part of LA. They were out here for a retreat last weekend. And he called me, he says, oh, I'm so-and-so from the coastal region, and I've got a cousin that lives in Yucca Valley. And he's single, he's 34, and we had a study with him, and he's really open, Danny. He really wants to study the Bible. And uh, do we have someone up there that can study the Bible with him? I said, oh, yeah, we sure do. And I talked to Derek, and I think that's in the works. You know, God is just opening the doors in incredible ways. And I thought about Yucca. It's great to have a few of them here with us tonight. It's becoming quite the singles hub for the church. This could be our fourth single brother added in this summer. They've already had three that have come on in. So who would have thought Yucca's the hub for the singles? Amen? Amen. I just see God working to help turn, to have people turn themselves in. Let's pick it up in verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they asked, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, 
a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The second thing here I want us to look at and consider is constant prayer. Jesus told the apostles that the Holy Spirit is going to come on you. And his message, and their message is going to spread throughout the whole world. Before their eyes, imagine this, Jesus, after he says, just ascends into heaven for the last time. And they were all just kind of looking up into the sky, they said, just kind of mesmerized by it all. And a couple of angels say, hey, what are you looking at? Right? That can be us sometimes, right? We can just kind of be looking up in the clouds. Come on, God, where are you there? Right? We've got to be careful. That's not us. That's where they're at. We can have our heads in the clouds. There's a lot to do this fall, church, in desert cities. We need to be ready to serve and to work. But first, we must pray. Amen. First, we've got to be committed to praying. They return to the city after Jesus ascends. They get their heads out of the clouds from Mount Olives. What else happened there? Anybody know? What else happened at Mount Olives? Any ideas? What else was up there? Matthew 26, hit. Gethsemane, right. Jesus liked to go up there. That's where he told him. That's where he ascended from. He liked to get up high to pray and to get close to God. So they get back to the city and they start making a bunch of plans. Is that what they did, right? No. They get back to the city. Then they plan a campaign. No, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Is that what they did? No. They get to the city and they get all anxious. What does this mean? What did Jesus say? They don't do any of that, right? They get back to the city and they were constantly in prayer. The Bible says. That means all the time. Constant means all the time. Prayer is one of the big themes throughout the book of Acts as well. It's how we communicate with God. Prayer was not something the first disciples did. It was who they were. Who are we? Do we plan first or do we pray? Is prayer who we are? Does that define us? Do you have a time of prayer daily? Are you constantly in prayer? And it was so inspiring to go to the Middle East for a number of reasons. And it just, you can't help but notice the Muslim religion, they are committed to prayer. They pray five times a day. And these alarms, just, they just go off in the city. And we were in Amman just, you know, they speak in Arabic. And you're just like, whoa, starting at 5 a.m., Wherever they're at, they just drop to the floor. They have the rugs they have with them, and they just drop to the floor and just start praying. We're like, wow. And they do it five times during the day. And the loudspeakers just go off to remind them to kind of keep them on task. And we shared about, you know, went camping. We were kind of up all night, didn't get a lot of sleep. At 5 a.m., that call to prayer came, and all the Muslims started to pray. They are devoted to prayer, even though they got a false religion, church. They don't even believe Jesus is the Son of God. That's the Muslim faith. That's a pretty big deal, right? How much more, as God's church, should we be committed to prayer when we have the truth and we get the opportunity to talk to God whenever we want? Amen? Amen. Matthew 7, in verse 7, talks about... Let's go there. Keep our finger there in Acts. we got time. Matthew 7. Jesus talks about prayer here. In verse 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. In his context here of asking, the Greek word, it means to persevere in prayer. It means keep on doing it. Not just one time. And that's hard, right? To keep praying for the same thing that doesn't happen over and over. And this is, we'll hear these stories, right? When our kids get baptized, that it's 15 years every day of prayer finally coming to fruition when their children become a disciple. Or you'll see them get married or a baby is born. Whatever it is, you'll just see God bless perseverance in prayer. And that's what he's talking about. Keep asking. Pray throughout the day. And I think this can just be short, powerful prayers. It doesn't have to be just the time when we have our quiet time, but we need to have that chunk of time when we pray to start our day. And I think maybe you're uh, going to be all inspired from the day, and maybe you're going to be going out. Maybe you're Jonathan, and he's going to share with his boss tomorrow to come to our Bring Your Neighbor Day next week, the luau. 
And he's a little nervous and he can pray, Father, give me boldness right now. And then he can get the words out. Hey, you want to come to church next Sunday and come and see what we're doing and be part of our Leo? That's a good prayer to pray for Jonathan then, right? Maybe you're uh, Nympha and, uh, or no, it's maybe you're, let's, let's say you're Kelly May. You're, your daughter just went off to school yesterday and you're a little bit anxious and you miss her and they're off and Alessandra's there and I picked on Martha and the Kingdom Kids when we had this. You're Kelly and your daughter's there and you're anxious. Oh my gosh, she's at school for the first time. I hope she's going to do well and get tied in and have a lot of friends and do great spirits. And maybe what's a good prayer for Kelly this week? God, give me peace. Father, give me peace right now. Help me not be anxious. Help Jessica do great down in San Diego. Maybe you're a student and you're starting school or you've already started. And an exam is coming, right? They come quickly, don't they, students? And you don't really know the answers, whatever it is. God, give me recall. Give me recall, but that's a good prayer to pray, right? Maybe you're a married couple, and you're in an argument, and it's just not going well. It's like, wow, every word out of my mouth, he or she just jumps on it, and what am I going to do? What's a good prayer right then? God, give me humility. Help me be quick to listen and slow to speak right now, right? Amen. Amen. So it can be short, powerful prayers. Don't put God in a box. We need to have our quiet time, but throughout the day, talk to Him. Remember, He is our Father. He's there 24-7, 365. Wherever you're at, He's at. Acts 17, 24, Paul says to the uh, Greek there, the high officials in that chapter, he, he says, remember, God is not confined to just temples or churches. He's everywhere. Our conception of God can be skewed by our own human mind. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He's different than we can imagine. He's far more glorious, far more powerful than we could possibly imagine. John just fell down with the vision of heaven. Paul says heaven is better by far than anything here on earth. Let God run loose in your minds, in your hearts, church, this fall as you commune with Him and talk to Him and pray with Him. Go to inspiring spots. I talked with uh, Steve Lounsbury this morning, and our staff's going to go to this waterfall area in Rancho Cucamonga. I said, wow, that must be the only waterfall in that whole city. He goes, yeah, and we're going up to it. And it'll be great. It'll be inspiring just to go up there and really pray just as a staff and lift up our prayers to God. That'll be an inspiring time. Mix it up. Make the time to do it. When was the last time you had a, an hour to pray with God? Say you had a canceled appointment. Or you just had some free time. You just took an hour just to pray to God and lift up your voice to Him. I know for me it's been a while since I've done that. I'm looking forward to doing that this fall. James Dobson, the great Christian author, he's written a number of books. Uh, Dare to Discipline, Love Must Be Tough, uh, Bringing Up Boys, Bringing Up Girls. Really a great author. A lot of great stuff he's written in. He said that his dad was a very prayerful guy. And when his father passed, he had two words, two simple words on his tombstone that he wanted to be remembered by. And they put it on there, and, and he, had, he made it very known before that. Here's what I want on there. And the two words were, he prayed. That's what he wanted to be remembered by. That was his legacy to his family and everyone that knew him. He prayed. So did the first century Christians. So should we, right? right. Amen. Let's look at one example on how they prayed. There's so many. Let's look at Acts 4 in verse 22. We'll just touch on one, how they were constantly in prayer. Uh, on the release, verse 23, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They were just released from prison. They're excited. They're lifting up their voices to God. They're praying. And the whole building shakes. That's a good prayer, right? That's a good prayer. That got, got God's attention. 
You know, I thought back over the summer, and even this past week just with my son Caleb, I, it was great. I really got to pray a lot, uh, a lot more than I have probably in other summers. And, you know, when you got 30 hours each way on a plane in the Middle East, you got some extra time there. I spent a lot of it praying. You know, when you're up kind of with jet lag and you're not sleeping, it's the middle of the night. Nothing else to do but really kind of just pray. And it's just, it really, really helped me. And I think back, that was very encouraging to think back over the summer, uh, just my own prayer life. You know, God wants to do so much in the coming years in our church. I ran into somebody uh, last week. I was in Orange County. He's from the desert. He's not part of our church. And somehow he knew about Scott and Danielle, that they were hired here, that we have another couple helping us with the church. And he asked me, he goes, are you going to start building multiple churches now out in the desert, now that you got some help? Are you going to get like two or three locations, this and that? I said, no, we're going to try and build the one we have. We're going to start with that. Our vision for us, so you know, is to have a church of hundreds. A lot more than we even have already. And in the staff, it was so cool. We were just dreaming and praying and talking. We said, how cool would it be, how inspiring to have the three groups, Rancho, Riverside, and the Desert, each have 500 disciples in our lifetime. Be able to see that. Have 1,500 in the Inland Empire region. You say, wow, that'd be awesome, right? That's pretty exciting. And then Steve told us, he said, in 2000, he and Carrie were here. The Inland Empire baptized 300 people. Maybe you were baptized in that year, and he had the names on this newsletter. It was inspiring to see and say, wow. That is exciting. I've got two specific challenges for you on constant prayer. You ready for them? Yeah. The first one is this. I want to encourage you and challenge you. Pray every day for every person in your family group by name. We've got a lot of new family groups, right? I know we had our first meeting kind of last week, two weeks ago. And a lot of us don't even know each other in the group. That's a good way to have your, each other on your heart is by lifting their names up in prayer. The second one is pray for lost souls daily. Pray to love them. Pray to be selfless, specifically for God to open up their heart. And be praying that you can reach out every day to advance God's kingdom. Will you do it? Yes. Will you do it? Yes. I mean, I mean. All right, in closing here, the two main things we talked about, we're going to wrap it up from this chapter. Jesus casts a vision. The first one is world evangelism from verse 8. Jesus sets his vision in the hearts of the apostle. It needs to be our vision as well as his disciples. Secondly is constant prayer from verse 14. We need to pray first, then we need to plan, and we do need to work each day for the rest of of our lives. Next week is going to be a very exciting chapter. Jesus' church begins. It explodes with 3,000 baptisms on the very first day. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah.